Welcome to the PID webinar, an evening learning event for everybody. We are trying to get Pakistan energized into thinking and talking. So let's see if we can succeed. We had a great webinar on this subject yesterday. Today we're going to take up the subject of aid and uh, um, aid conditionality and the politics of aid once again. So let's begin. begin with this cartoon from a local newspaper. Can everybody see my slides? Can everybody see my slides? Yes, sir, we can or see. Can everybody? And yes. you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Look at this cartoon where we've got the IMF, the big fat landlord chasing a poor Pakistani with loans dangling in front and a craggy landscape ahead. This kind of symbolizes what we are going to discuss today. So this is the second in our series, my mistake. It's the second in our series. We will and I urge you all to mute your mic and let the speakers speak first. So you've seen the number of question that we were to put on our flyers, and there'll be a lot more. We are going to talk about how foreign aid impacts on Pakistan. And yesterday we presented one PAT thesis. Today we're going to present another PAT thesis, Hussain Nadeem, a um, well-known Pakistani young scholar who studied his PAT from Australia, and did his PAT on the subject of aid, and especially US aid. So he's going to give us an analysis, an overview of the Reloga and the US aid uh, impact on Pakistan. And with him, we've got our eminent ambassador, Robin Rafu, who's well known in Pakistan, who's served to Pakistan, who's done uh, many things in Pakistan, a friend of Pakistan. Uh, she has been said with the State Department, many things in, in the US, ambassador, as I said, and she is an let me take you directly to this cartoon from 1960. It's not new. If you see 1960, this is discussing the Truman Four Point Program for Pakistan, dollars and poor Pakistan. I think it's one or two guys limping along with the dollars, dollar crutches. People. The, room looking through the window and should keep him in place. So it symbolizes again what we are going to discuss. So let's overview, let me do the programs. Boy, do we have fun programs. We in the country never gets to the emergency ward. We are always in the emergency ward. Despite being in the emergency ward, long-term growth is coming down. Long-term growth is coming down. And I'm repeating these slides for these messages into our Pakistani economies. We also see our investment rate is low and constantly declining. Now, show that we should bear in mind if you program rate not good like India or China or even Sri Lanka, I think we should worry about that. Apologies. The internet, the internet is getting choked up. The internet is getting choked up. And uh, we are going to have these problems more and more in the coming future. We're going to get logged out of these meetings again and again. 
So let me go back to my slides and show you what I was trying to show you. Okay, we've had a series of webinars and those webinars point to many things. First of all, that we've had a policy inconsistency and a poor policy development, especially our tax policy is a disaster. And I think donors have a lot to do with that. There are huge transaction costs in our economy. Nobody can invest with, without transactions costs. There are huge transactions costs to buying anything, doing anything, as I discovered even today, even buying a consumer good. I won't tell you my story, but it's very difficult. We've also discovered that there's no HRM in Pakistan. There's no human resource management, neither in the corporate sector nor in the government sector and in the corporate sector, especially maybe in the government sector too. There is a state mentality which says a huge hierarchy and hierarchy, me hierarchy means everything and work and innovation and productivity means nothing. Markets are heavily overregulated. Energy. Energy is a governance problem for the last 11 years. We spent 6 trillion rupees in energy. We wasted, wasted. We are wasting another 2 trillion in PSC reform and we are unable to do either. Cities are a huge problem. The prime minister has woken up to the fact that it's construction that's going to drive the economy. But unfortunately, he hasn't taken the full leap and discovered that cities that will destroy make the economy. And then we've got huge information and risk taking issues. So I want you to keep this in your back, in your back of your mind because these are important things to worry about it. Now, in terms of foreign aid, we've seen also, and we've discussed this yesterday, and we've discussed this before. There is yesterday, Fahim Jahangir mapped out beautifully how extensive foreign aid is and how much it's taken over the country. And then this aid is provided without accountability, without responsibility. For example, all our laws, recent laws, not all, but quite a few of our laws have been made by foreign aid. For example, the unbundling of BAPTA was done by USA. The NEPRA Act was made by USA Aid. The CCP Act Competition Commission was made by the World Bank. TARP was made by the World Bank, which means tax policy was made by the World Bank. Civil service reform was done by the World Bank, and we got people going to Harvard, but nothing much happened. The public financial management law has just been done by DFID and uh, um, Oxford Policy Management. SAP with the World Bank did set up a number of NGOs which still plague us. And then we just put out a blog yesterday who controls our thought industry. And I had to talk with the HEC yesterday that we should close down all our, all our universities and research because, hey, we don't need them because all the research of the government, all the thinking of the government happens with donors. So this is the background, folks, why we arrange this uh, webinar. With this background, I'll give the floor to Hussein Nadim to present his dissertation and liven up the discussion. Then we'll bring in um, Robin Rafel. I must apologize on behalf of uh, my friend, Mr. Ben Fazdeh, who for health reasons is unable to join us. He will join us in the next webinar. Hussein, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Saab, uh, for the introduction of Pied and the exact work you guys are doing. Uh, we're doing some great work on. Uh, on webinars, because you've been a very really loud voice on uh, foreign aid and other aspects of development. Uh, I wasn't sure I was supposed to present my uh, PhD thesis, but uh, I will stick around to that and try to focus exactly on uh, the politics of foreign aid and how foreign aid is conceived and what are some of the issues related to foreign aid. I'll begin with some uh, one of these lines that I was actually the opening chapter of my PhD thesis as well. Was that when we think of uh, development, when when we think of development, we tend to imagine young, passionate kids working in development countries around the world doing some excellent work. Uh, but when we think about security, we tend to think about the uh, military people in uniform, guns, and books, and other aspects. Seldom do we actually think about development as an extension of security and politics or security as a sort of uh, precursor or a sort of extension of development at the same time. What I'm trying to essentially get at is that there has been in the past two or three decades a reconceptualization of these two very large and separate uh, domains of security and development where these two have kind of integrated in a way where we now have human security and human development. And the lines are in a sort of flux where we don't know where to draw what. The politics of aid, what we talk about, is essentially under this particular context that we talk about. It's uh, all aid, all foreign aid is essentially political. There is no such thing as non-political aid. It's all essentially politics. 
uh, again, foreign aid is also part of a particular intervention in the developing countries, which becomes problematic, and we have to see it as that. So when we think of foreign aid, for instance, when the Pakistani government looked at during the Perry Lugabam Act, it thought that $7.5 billion coming from the U.S. is all good. We don't recognize at that time that aid is a sort of intervention that has uh, consequences that can uh, damage your national cohesion, that can have uh, other serious consequences as well. But that is only one part of how can we look at the aid. The aid can be conceptualized, uh, can be looked at on two levels. One is the conceptual, philosophical level on the intent of the aid. Why, for instance, the United States wants to spend in Pakistan. And at the core of it, we will realize certain uh, grand strategies of the United States, how it sees the world. But at the same level, we have to also look at things at the final level, which is the practical level of aid in terms of understanding how the different departments of the United States government, for instance, the U.S. aid and State Department, are at odds over the disbursement of aid to Pakistan. And within Pakistan, there are different multiple factions on how the aid can be implemented, whether the aid can be implemented in a particular way or the other way. And what is the efficacy of aid that we talk about? So uh, it is rather, uh, but I would add one thing before I uh, step on to the other conversation is that the amount of conversation in Pakistan that happens around aid is way too much compared to the actual amount of aid that comes to Pakistan. I don't know why we have uh, sort of controversialized or created a fuss around aid of a very small peanut like funding and uh, somehow developed expectations around aid as something that will change Pakistan or something that is supposed to change Pakistan. So I think there, is, there are some unrealistic expectations around aid. And that, again, goes back to the original problem of aid at the discursive level and aid at the practical level. For instance, the promise of aid by the U.S. government in, let's say, in the past uh, 10, 15 years of Kerry Obama Act was essentially in its own writing that uh, in five years, we will provide Pakistan with $7.5 billion. And based on the performance, we will provide an extension of five, uh, five more years. So, so the promise of aid at times is a lot more incentivized sort of way uh, than the actual aid that comes on the ground. So if we have to study aid and if we have to look at the politics of aid, we have to look at the U.S. foreign interests in our country. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on Pakistan. The U.S. has had a very clear foreign policy on Pakistan. Uh, if I may add to this thing, that U.S. foreign policy towards Pakistan has been more on the lines of uh, having a particular foreign policy towards an institution. It has been a U.S. government the relations with the Pakistan army for the last uh, 70 years or something. And that has been the centerpiece of that entire uh, aid network. So when we look at the numbers, the military aid and the security aid, it skyrockets. And when we look at any the government, the idea was to actually balance that. But unfortunately, because the U.S. government interests in Pakistan for the last, uh, ever since 9-11 specifically, has been so much related to the security, my original thesis about these two things merging together, the security and the development, they become problematic because then you're spending aid, but you're expecting security as a result. And sometimes you're doing security and expecting development as a result. So these two different worlds have combined together. And I personally think that Pakistan has become a sort of victim of a total blunder of U.S. foreign policy in many ways. Uh, but I don't like to completely blame the United States only on this issue. I think the specific elite establishment in Pakistan that controls the security, the development, that is also at the centerpiece of this entire problem. Because under the pretext of national security or radicalization, the Pakistan's establishment or uh, the political brass and the military brass they have received aid for the longest years uh, and kind of radicalized the people as well in the process that uh, the U.S. has provided us with uh, no money and we've given so much sacrifices. So in terms of the U.S. and Pakistan politics of the year, it's such a clash of narratives between the two countries that it is almost impossible to entangle the two. And I think the both countries, are the elite the establishments in the both countries have have really created a blunder out of the relations with each other in very short term. So I don't blame the U.S. only for the short term relations. I think the government of Pakistan as well has had very little interest in actual development through the aid. So, I mean, why blame the United States for using aid as a political tool 
when the government of Pakistan itself, as for the longest time, uh, used the aid as a way to uh, enrich uh, their political agendas as well. So that I would start off with that, and then we can build on the conversations on specifically how the aid is actually dispersed, uh, what type of aid comes in, and why, and uh, other semantics around the aid. Okay. Well, um, let's go on, Rob. Let me ask you. You've heard what um, Hussein says, and I used right. Uh, and I, your friends in the US, many of the, many of the analysts argue that our relationship has been very, very venal and economic. We have been too dependent economically on the US, and US also has felt that we are merely an economic beggar, let's put it that way, and kind of treated us accordingly. How do you see this relationship? How do you see the political um, politics of aid of Hussein? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hopefully the internet will uh, bear with us. Uh, let me just go back to a few basics. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm grateful that um, uh, Hussein, uh, that it wasn't the, the mess and the muddle and so on wasn't entirely the fault of the US, that that was shared by Pakistan, which is a view to which I um, completely agree. But let me back up a bit, uh, because a lot of the aid discussion has, has been around the Kerry Luger Berman Act uh, back in 2009, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and let's remember what the Kerry Luger Berman Act was really about. Uh, it authorized the US administration, the Congress authorized the administration to spend up to $7.5 billion over five years. It did not guarantee that the administration would ask for that, that the Congress each year would approve that money, but it, it was, a, was a gesture to say, we want to be supportive of, Af of Pakistan and we want to demonstrate that the people and their development is as important as the military. So that was the whole goal there. Um, I also think that it's important to remember that broadly, the US as a donor uh, has good intentions. You know, we believe like many other countries that uh, poverty alleviation and economic development is an absolute good. It improves lives, it improves prospects for democracy, stability, and we still believe that that's all a good thing. It is political, as Hussein said. The um, you know everybody who gives aid, whatever donor, wants to enhance their influence. That's what we would were wanting to do as well. We wanted to advance our influence with the Pakistani public, um, and and uh, advance the impression that we cared about people as much about uh, as we did about the military and the war on terror and so on and so forth. We also wanted to advance US values and still do. Democracy, human rights, rule of law, all these things that we uh, believe make for a better society. So our intentions were good. I want to underscore that because I know the implementation had many, many problems and there were many, many challenges. Uh, in my view, and much has been written about this, there was simply too much money up front. We couldn't program it, we couldn't prioritize it. Uh, either on our side or the Pakistani government side, there were different views about how this money should be spent. And this is where the security uh, and development um, ideas tend to blend, as Hussein was saying. Um, the, there was the short-term stabilization um, uh, imperative imposed by the military, the desire to bring stabilization with small projects to FATA, and then there was on the other side the development uh, imperative, a much longer term uh, prospect. Uh, there was a desire, there was a thought that aid should be visible so that people would know that it was coming. 
uh, and could see what it was doing for the people. But then there was also the uh, idea that you really need human capital development, education, health, and so on, uh, democracy programs, which are much less visible. There were pressures from the Congress, the US Congress, who uh, approve the budget each year, uh, tended to favor health and education. Um, I've already mentioned the interagency differences between the military and USAID. Uh, the State Department, quite honestly, was somewhere in between, and they had taken on some the actual implementation of some sorts of projects and rule of law, for example, and counter narcotics, which tended to to lead to the question of who was in charge on the US side. Um, there was the whole problem for the US of uh, short uh, tours of the staff who didn't really get to know the program, let alone the country, in the one year that they were there. And they couldn't travel around much anyway because of security concerns. Um, there was a whole issue of who would implement. Would we give the money to the Pakistan government? Would we give the money to NGOs? A lot of tensions there. And we had our whole contractor system where a lot of USAID projects are implemented by third party contractors. And the relationship between aid and those contractors is very prescribed uh, through legal documents. And it's very hard to know what they're actually doing sometimes. Uh, then you have the problem of expectations being very, very high. Um, we've, we've seen that um, over the last, well, from time immemorial, over the last 70 years, but we've certainly seen it with Kerry Luger Berman, um, you know, that, that, that people were disappointed, expectations were high, this money is coming, what is it really doing? So these were huge challenges on the US side. And of course, on the Pakistan side, from, from the US dealing with Pakistani colleagues, um, they hadn't prioritized their, their needs. What did they want us to do? What did they want others, donors to do? Um, we, we had conversations about this, but they really, weren't, they really weren't very productive. The US side brought their ideas. Um, and on the Pakistan side, there wasn't enough prioritization between uh, the national level, the planning commission, the economic affairs division, the provinces, the various ministries, all competing for this money. So there was no clear prioritization. And the absorptive capacity on the Pakistan side was, was limited. And then, of course, you had the whole problem of uh, the need for economic reform, the lack of economic reform, the problem of corruption, and so on. So altogether, vast, vast challenges. I think I'll stop there having spoken about the challenges. I, I can speak later about um, the way forward. Okay, let me then just take this up. Both of you have said that the money is part of the deal to gain influence. And here on our part, we feel or the recipient feels that we need the money and in a sense, as I go back to my friend, the economic hitman, in a sense, the need is also created that we need the money because it, it comes with large amount of technical assistance and there's a large amount of pressure. You do this, you do that. And, then, and, in a, and there's a large amount of pressure from the UN and the multilateral bodies that we have to set up various institutions, various things. For example, money laundering is not our problem, but yes, we have to set it up, right? So all those things require money and then we have to borrow for them. Now I ask you, both of you said that uh, objectives of aid, to my mind, hearing you a bit confused. Is it to help the poor or is it to gain foreign policy influence? And I want to set it up slightly differently now. What Trump is doing to TikTok and Huawei, it seems Trump is also concerned about the influence of commerce or something in his economy. And I think Hussein, Robin, you know better than I do, I'm just an economist. There is a new discovery in the Western scholars coming out of Brookings, et cetera, Robin, where you are, something called the fifth generation warfare. 
would I, can I extrapolate and say that aid is a kind of fifth generation warfare because it's seeking influence? And I'll to set that up a little differently. Robin, we had a webinar with Gustav Papanek. I don't know whether you remember him or not. Gustav mm. Papanek was the guy who brought USAID to Pakistan, one of the first people to come to Pakistan and give us aid. And he's still alive and he was very coherent and he gave us a lovely webinar. And he talked about how the fact that Pakistan it was, itself was confused and didn't know what to do, that it created space for the USAID consultants to come in and literally take over the country. They even made Islamabad, right? And you're saying the same thing, we are still confused. I take that point, exactly. We are totally confused, we have no policy, agreed. But then let's go to the objectives of aid. Is it to gain influence? Is it to help us? Is it fifth generation warfare? Robin, can you comment then, Hussein? You know, I would say it's all of the above, Nadeem. Uh, you know, to gain influence, yes. We're trying to gain influence in the Cold War. The Russians were trying to get influence, gain influence. We were, we were uh, competing all over Africa and, and Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, today, it's more with the Chinese, as, as Pakistan well knows. But I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. Um, I already said that we, we still tend to believe that poverty alleviation is a good thing for everybody. It's, it's a good thing for Pakistan, any other country. And if it, if it leads, as the theory goes, to, um, uh, to prosperity and therefore stability, that's also good for everybody. The main problem, I, as I see it, which is a big one, and a lot is written about this in all the think tanks here, Center for Global Development, whether it's Brookings or others, but those who specialize in development, is there's a lot in development that we actually don't know how to help with. We know how to build roads. We know how to provide humanitarian assistance. Um, we know how to make, uh, uh, to build power plants, make energy systems more efficient. But when it comes to education, health, these, these uh, you know, non-infrastructure type interventions, which we've been doing you know, forever in Pakistan and the results simply aren't there. So I think, um, it behooves us all to be on the on the donor side and on Pakistan side to be a bit more humble about how you actually bring social change and social progress. I, you know, I just think we we don't really know how to do it, and that's a big part of the problem. Okay, what's that? Your thoughts? Hi. Uh, so the. This idea somehow that aid is any aid is about the uh, gaining influence. I mean, that's I think given. I, I, there's not even a debate on that. Uh, but aid has evolved in the past 70 years. Specifically, if you look at the United States aid to Pakistan, it has evolved. It has come from developing Mangla Dam to building hearts and minds under President Obama, and now with uh, President Donald Trump, it's, it's essentially a military assistance. Uh, now. I think that is, again, it is a sort of intervention in the third world countries, in the developing countries. And that, that intervention is a lot to do with how aid and politics is happening in the United States and in specifically Bedouin. Now, with the changing American priorities, the, the aid under Democrats is very different from the aid under Republicans. Their priorities, their way of looking at the world, their liberalism, their neoconservatism, it's entirely reliant on that. The problem becomes part of the recipient as well. Then, as a recipient, how do you manage your priorities in the changing priorities of the United States? And that is where the real problem comes in. That aid, like uh, Robin uh, rightly mentioned, that it is it is political. It is to buy influence. But as she mentioned, that is it's it's how it is done. There is no problem with that. So I think there is one thing that needs clarity and which needs to be established is that aid is the priority is to buy the influence, but what more can you get out of that? That is where the key is. Are you getting the access out of it or not? The core problem with, I believe, the Kerry Luga Berman Act was that when the aid was being dispersed, bypassing the government, 
directly to the NGOs. That created a very serious problem for the military and the intelligence agencies in Pakistan because under the winning hearts and minds, there were over a hundred or more NGOs that were being funded. Uh, there were visas that were being stamped, NGO workers that were coming into Pakistan, which was creating a lot of anxiety. Uh, the aid industry was going out of control. The money was flooding in. Nobody had an idea where the money was going. And there was just too much of it where uh, then we noticed how certain events happened in Pakistan where through the development sector, the NGO sector and other development funding, and the Guardian published a long report about this as well, that security interests were also being met. So for a developing country like Pakistan, a post-colonial state, aid is kind of like a sort of remnant of that neo-colonial ideology where it is an intervention in these countries through other means. Now, that is one aspect of how we can look at it. But again, I don't blame the United States alone in that. This is the fact that our political governments, our military establishment, they understand it very effectively on the politics of aid. Yet, they engage the United States in these aid relations. Part of the reason why I do believe is this, uh, that this happens is because uh, it allows the government of Pakistan and our ruling elite to influence the United States in return. So it's not only that the US is able to influence us through aid, the way we are able to influence the United States back in Washington DC, for instance, where we have been able to cultivate particular narratives about Pakistan being a victim of the US imperialism or the militancy that is going to take down Pakistan. These ideas of on the brink, they're not only created in the United States, they're also created right here within our establishment that if the U.S. does not provide us aid, we have sort of gun on our head and things are going to blow apart. So aid comes into that entire global neo-colonial politics where it becomes very hard to entangle these different ideas where you have so many different groups. You have military industrial complex and then you have aid development complex as well. Where the contracting, where the fundings and the beltway bandits like we used to call them, uh, they engage in a very sort of vicious cycle where there are larger interests that play over there, strategic interests, but underneath those strategic interests at the operational level, there's multipolarity of interests that are operating. So different aid industries, different arms of the state in Pakistan and the US, the way they're interacting, it's a hodgepodge and a chaos. But that chaos, I do not believe is just out there on its own. There is a, there is a method in that chaos. And if you notice the aid throughout the Kerry Luga Burman Act or uh, most of the 9-11, I mean, the aid to Pakistan was practically nil before 9-11. So when 9-11 happened in 2002, the aid was increased. The entire idea about that is that it is security aid. Even if it is development aid, it is meant for security, uh, security reasons. So down to how did the U.S. entangle Pakistan out of this entire narrative? It's nearly impossible because in the Washington, D.C., like you mentioned about Brookings, Pakistan is essentially discussed in two or three different large narratives. It is about civil military relations. It is about uh, militancy. It is about the nuclear disarmament. Beyond these three security-led uh, narratives and uh, narratives on Pakistan, there is practically no interest the United States have in this very small country that is there. So when you talk about politics of aid, aid becomes a sort of facilitator for the United States to have a discussion with the Pakistani counterparts on how do we engage in a sort of negotiated uh, expecting aid to deliver it may deliver but as part of the promise aid will never ever be able to deliver because it is not meant or designed to deliver i mean i have uh, total sympathies with people who work in the aid industry uh, in washington and the usa that they have the right intentions but if their intentions at the operational level do not matter uh, too much the intention at the strategic level that is where it matters a lot more which is why one of the things that me and Robin were discussing earlier is that every single year you have to renew and you have to get new uh, approvals for the aid. And then the paperwork that comes along with it, it does not reflect a U.S. strategic interest to actually conduct development. It is more of a discursive uh, practice that is there to allow for a particular policy and political interest to be uh, facilitated in the long run. So then let me stop you there. Let me ask you very simply, what are the key three three key items that you discovered in your thesis. What are the key, three key messages you want to give us from your thesis? After all, you spent two years studying it. 
So what problems did you see or what good things did you see? I don't mean to call you a problem. What are the three key messages you have? Uh, I think uh, broadly, there is uh, the aid is not well thought out. One. Uh, and it by is by design. Yeah, by both, parties. both parties or one party? Only? Both parties. Absolutely both parties. Uh, I, I personally don't think Pakistan... We, we should stop taking Pakistan as a weaker and a smaller country. Uh, we need to recognize that from a point of weakness and a relative uh, uh, disparity, Pakistan is able to exert a tremendous influence of the United States policy towards the region. Uh, for the last 70 years, I believe that Pakistan's establishment has found innovative and cutthroat ways to basically muscle the U.S. out in, in many ways and try to like align the U.S. interests with itself. So one thing is that it is, there is the aid is not well thought out. And there is a reason for that because it, the, the hazy and the vagueness of the aid allows for a lot more things to happen under the garb of the aid. Uh, second, a lot of what is happening in the civil military relations in Pakistan has a lot to do with the foreign interventions. Uh, the U.S. aid, I would say specifically the aid, but the U.S. influence in Pakistan, I mean, you look at the WikiLeaks, the WikiLeaks documents, the meetings between uh, uh, Joe Biden and President Zadari and different people's party, people back in 2008 and 9, uh, the conversations are very crisp and clear, uh, where the expectations are that the United States would help keep the military in Pakistan at bay, and the U.S. will provide a particular amount of money to Pakistan for the civilians to establish so I think in these civil military conversations, the U.S. come into very prominently. So that was one of the uh, things that I recognized. But third thing that I kind of went really deeper into it, and I believe is that uh, for U.S., Pakistan is a very small piece of the puzzle. But for Pakistan, the United States is uh, at the core of its global policy. And how it presents itself, for instance, I believe that this entire... Uh, image of Pakistan as a country on a brink and how it's a destabilized country is that these narratives have been generated right here from Pakistan. So for the U.S. to be engaged, and I think I'll add one more thing or to that, I think we have a particular ruling elite that has uh, used and sabotaged, unfortunately, the U.S.-Pakistan relations in its own way uh, to present the larger public in Pakistan as anti-American and somehow very Islamists and militants. And presenting themselves as the saviors of democracy or saviors of liberalism for the United States. I think that particular elite is at the core of a uh, problem in Pakistan, uh, which has not been very uh, honest uh, in aid. And I think one, I agree with Robin in her point yesterday that she made the critical problem with the aid relations between the two countries is that the both countries are not honest to each other. Uh, and the dishonesty has become so warped into layers that they both understand the same problem. The only difference is that in every few years, the entire Congress and uh, the U.S. establishment changes, flushes out, comes into the U. Pakistan's institutional memory goes back 70 years. So the current establishment in Pakistan is continuing its 1970s era understanding of the United States, which is why they has not been able to have a reset. And that... Uh, that absence of reset allows Pakistan to have a policy with the United States that it can just practically uh, muscle out the United States in, in many ways. But, uh, Robin, uh, I mean, you know, when you say that aid has evolved, and that aid has got into many different things thanks to political process. Now, for example, we saw yesterday when we analyzed the aid program that the average size of the Kerry Luger project was 0.5 million dollars. That means 500 thousand dollars. There are a lot of small projects. Average size was about 500 thousand dollars of each project. We had a number of. I think we have 500 projects or something like that. If I remember the data, we can pull up the slide. But we have a strong analysis on this. It's a very small number of projects. And then the contractors, the contractors whom we don't know. And I remember, Robin, you remember your good friend, Rob uh, Holbrook, actually spoke against the contractors. And he was on record saying that the contractors are kind of destroying the whole aid apparatus. And we have seen, we don't even know USAID or no donor agency gives us the name of the contractors. We have no idea what the contractors are doing. So one thing is the aid is being dissipated in a large number of different projects. 
to the contractors. We don't even know what money they take. And we honestly, Hussain, I think, did you make a calculation on how much money actually came in from Kerry Luger into Pakistan or did you not? I thought you did. Can you tell us that first? How much money actually came into Pakistan from the five billion that was dispersed? Hussain? Uh, it was $1.8 billion that uh, was actually dispersed on ground. And of, of which there was uh, uh, the details on how much it went in back to the U.S. in contracting. Uh, not really there because the U.S. aid data sets are so technical. And I believe that they are on purpose made so technical with that jargon for us to not understand many of the things. On there. So Robin, $3 billion was kept at source. Roughly $2 billion or A1.8 came in, which we don't even know how much went back. So quite frankly, Pakistan received relatively nothing. And then the thing that I worry about is, you mentioned it, you've got into democracy, into advocacy, and not just you, everybody's got into democracy, advocacy, so many things that I venture to say that if China did that in the US, Congress would be up in arms. Would it not? Okay, Nadim, um, I can't disagree with anything you've said there. Uh, there are way too many projects, and that is the result of the competing priorities with the Congress, interagency, and so on and so forth. So there has to be something for everybody. It is not a good thing. Uh, uh, I have to say, just specifically from my experience, when Hina Rabbani Carr uh, was the Minister of State and, and supervising a lot of this, she took all the donors to task about having way too many projects. Uh, and, and forced all of us to cut back, which, which was a good thing. But you're absolutely right. And that is the problem of prioritization. And both sides uh, are bad at that. Uh, contractor implementation has grown enormously over the last 20 years. And part of the issue there is because I think it's many people who follow USAID and the US donor community, USAID um, had been staff had been cut way back after the Vietnam War. So when 9-11 came along, they were understaffed in terms of their core staff. So everything, uh, so much of it then went to contractors and that's a business. It, contractors have a huge business. They're very influential in Congress. So that's a, that's a problem that we have. And as I mentioned in my first remarks, the way the contracting works uh, aid officers are very limited um, in what they can actually ask and talk to the contractors about. So there's a, there's a, you know, to the, to the, uh, you know, common person that makes absolutely no sense at all. And I used to get in trouble regularly talking directly to contractors to try to figure out what was going on when I was supervising the program. So you're right there. That is a problem. Um, the data uh, you know, I was looking just for my own interest um, at statistics for aid, trying to get some general statistics in terms of, of uh, obligations, disbursements, and so on and so forth, as you were uh, asking Hussein. And it is impossible to sort of, uh, the, the data is all over the place. Some of it's very, very specific websites with all kinds of details, but none of it is, is brought together in a way that you can make general statements. So I, I don't find it particularly helpful. But these are all issues uh, that need to be debated for the future. I mean, as I said, one, there are way too many projects. There was frankly way too much money for us to absorb in a responsible way. And in terms of anything other than humanitarian assistance, infrastructure, and a couple of others, the theory about how you bring social change and economic progress is, is changing day by day. We do not understand how to do it. You know, if we did and you did, you know, you'd have uh, literacy rates of 90%, right? Mm -hmm. And no polio, for example. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I'm humbled by that and I think we all should be. No, that's fair enough. But yet, it doesn't stop the aid establishment from telling us that democracy is good for you, that we have the Andaz program, the Karandas program, the Awaz program, and we've got $500 million worth of advocacy programs, right? How, about, 
yeah. just say no. I think that's a very good idea. Hossein, would you, how do you react to that? Uh, before you go, Hossein, before you go, let me ask. We've got Naseem Zara here. Naseem Zara is a very, very famous analyst as well as anchor. She's written a very good book on Kargil. Naseem, how would you answer that question? Why can't we say no? And what is your comments on this dialogue? Naseem Zara. Can you hear me now? Okay, I think that, yeah, that's the, that is the critical issue. Let me just make three or four very quick points. I've been listening to the whole discussion. Number one, I think that by and large, um, uh, US has, would do its thinking every time it came for engagement with Pakistan uh, because of uh, geostrategic reasons and gave the aid that it gave. I think for the for the primary purpose that it would engage, I, engage, I think that it by and large achieved what it did. I am not discussing in this aid context, Nadeem, anything to do, uh, anything to do with, you know, genuine development or social change because I think that's not what aid is about, and that's not how the donor, generally speaking, there can be um, exceptions. But in the case of the U.S., it hasn't come into Pakistan to, uh, you know, to reform and to, you know structural reform, social reform, it has always come with its very specific objective and, and you know, fair enough. I think the U.S. As an, as an independent state, as a country has a right to that. I think the questions we need to ask is of ourselves throughout. I would say to, I submit to you that um, the way we've engaged with the U.S., whether it was in the 50s or whether it was in the 80s and, you know, subsequently during General Musharraf's time, I think now it's kind of different. We are, you know, we're in a gray zone right now. But uh, most of the times we uh, presented ourselves as, um, you know, as a, a derivative of the U.S. Um, uh, geostrategic thinking. I don't want to take up too much time. I can go into detail at another time. You know, every time we engage, it was, we were saying to the U.S., okay, we see the way you see the world, and hence we will do ABC. And so U.S. achieved what it wanted to. We, for example, um, you know, our goal in the 50s to build up our, um, our uh, shore up our defenses, etc., security. And I'm right now, none of this is a judgment statement. I'm just stating facts. So we achieved that in the 50s. In the 80s, we engaged and, you know, what was the outcome? It's all clear. But let me submit to you that I don't think that uh, you, Pakistan at any, any, any given point was able to shape the narrative in Washington. Not at all. Uh, every time the narrative was, I mean, U.S. knew what it was doing. Let me give you an example. For example, in the 80s, at the height of our engagement with the U.S., absolutely the height of engagement over the Afghanistan war, um, when we were fighting, you know, the the holy war for uh, the U.S., I mean, we co-authored it. I'm not uh, putting the responsibility on the U.S., but I'm saying even at that point, we were desperate for AWACS. And Robin will bear me out. We were desperate for AWACS and um, State Department, etc. And I was then in the U.S. and was following, um, you know, at the congressional hearings. They were very clear that Pakistan will not be given the AVAX because they will use it against India. So I'm just saying that the problem has been, you know, where we have stood in terms of our relationship with the US. We have tried to achieve objectives and kind of uh, institution uh, specific objectives or at times individual specific objectives. And uh, we, we have gained to the extent that we did, but uh, broadly speaking, it has not, uh, you know, it hasn't, uh, our objectives in engaging with the U.S. were not objectives to bring about social change in Pakistan, to bring about reform in Pakistan, to develop democracy in Pakistan. So I think positing the whole issue in that context, I think, is faulty. We've got to see what were the objectives. I think that Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has been, by and large, hugely lacking in its own thinking, in its own planning. And when I say lacking, I mean that you know, functioning as a state, as a government, as a coherent government where all departments sit down and draw policies. You know, what you've been talking about in these webinars, uh, Nadeem, forever. 
So I think that the Pakistan US policy, I cannot, uh, I have a real issue with the words trust with the term loyalty, with, the, uh, with that, you know, we've been stabbed in the back. This is not a relationship between people uh, with individuals. It's an interstate relationship. So US, uh, because of where it's sitting, because of the distance, because of, you know, its size and its relative, relatively clear thinking. Robin has a particular view on this. She may say, oh, you know, we haven't achieved what we wanted to and A, B, C, D. But I think that those who move forward in that relationship, Charlie Wilson and, uh, and uh, Reagan and that lot, they completely feel that they achieved what they wanted to and, uh, and they did in the Afghan war. What did we achieve? Look at the uh, writers in Pakistan in the 80s, all the, you know, the crying, the whining, the wailing, the superb analysis included. They were saying this is going to take us to hell, and it did. So I think that I would I would say that you know say no when you need to, but even before that, yeah. are you at the drawing board doing the kind of thinking you need to, the kind of analysis you need to, kind of interinstitutional uh, thinking that you need to, the planning that you need to. So so we uh, you know pulled uh, the rug from underneath the feet of the U.S. when Salala was you know that Salala attack. So in times of crisis, we did pull back. But, but tell me another time when we sat down and we said, look, for example, let me take you to what's happened in the last two days, three days. You know, Saudi Arabia, who remains a very, very close friend, strategically important friend, they said, you know, we want the money back for whatever reason. Pakistan said, okay, you take your money back. Pakistan didn't say, uh, you know, no, no, we'll go along. Let's do it differently. We kept doing that with the U.S. throughout except for, you know, in certain cases. So I think that there is some more serious thinking going on right now as we, you know, as we look at, uh, you know, regional economic integration, as we look at other areas, we look at multipolarity. I think that with the U.S., um, you know, there were times, most of the times we were quite okay with the way, you know, the U.S. was um, engaged with us. And someone, and this whole talk about contractors, I mean, for God's sakes, the contractors weren't, pushing their way into uh, into uh, Islamabad and into the rest of Pakistan, you were giving them visas. Who was giving them visas? I mean, I think we've got to look at the discordant um, uh, stuff that was happening within uh, Pakistan as well. So, um, of course, you can say no. And uh, and I mean, I'm not saying no, say no because you want to go populist. But I think the real issue is um, you've got to do your thinking. I mean, do you do your thinking, your planning, etc.? Sufficient sure. every which country, yeah. So let me just stop here. Okay, okay, thanks, uh, Naseem. I think that's very good. Let me take another few questions and I'll come back to you guys. Um, so let's say Fahim, Fahim Jahangir gave us a lovely talk yesterday. He's also done a dissertation on aid. So let's hear what Fahim has to say. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem, and uh, all the panelists. Uh, very interesting talk. I'm really enjoying that. Uh, if uh, May I request the host to allow me to share the screen. I was actually trying to show a graph from the Center for uh, Global Development. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. so there it is. Yep. So I, I would just add some uh, comments on 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 this slide. Uh, if 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 you see that uh, the historical trend of uh, can you see the slide? No, I can't. Can, we, can anybody else? Sir, can you can please you share, share, share again? It's a career. Can you see it now? Nope. Uh, okay, let me let me go back and. It was there, but it disappeared. Okay, is it there now? Yes. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm. Yep. So so. If you look at the uh, our U.S. Pakistan uh, uh, relation in the context of foreign aid, then U.S. has undoubtedly been a major development partner to Pakistan over the decades. Uh, but as Hussein mentioned and Robin also agreed to that, and Nasim Zahra uh, uh, very rightly also uh, talked about that, U.S. aid was primarily driven by foreign interest and foreign policy in Pakistan. Look at the graph uh, taken from. Uh, a study on aid to Pakistan by numbers. If you see these uh, three peaks, uh, 
between 1950s and then in 80s and and then after the post 9/11 uh, period then uh, so whenever us has stakes and geopolitical interest in pakistan we see sharp increase in inflow of us dollars to pakistan one cold war period second soviet afghan war period third post 9/11 period so look at the other times uh, when uh, they had lesser stakes in pakistan uh, then we have witnessed sharp decline in us dollar inflow and we not only this we even faced economic sanctions from us to pakistan a foreign self crystal amendment and then uh, sanctions after post uh, nuclear tests uh, in in the late 90s and the last point which i would like to mention here is that if you look at the political economy and the politics of foreign aid in pakistan with the context of us then us has a high influence on western bilateral donors and not only bilateral donors but even leading multilateral donors and their uh, engagement and their disbursement to pakistan and they have comparatively less influence uh, on asian and uh, uh, gulf bilateral donors so whenever uh, there was sanctions imposed by the us on pakistan uh, we pakistan is always look towards uh, our friends like china saudi arabia and uh, uae like that so uh, i just wanted to share this graph uh, uh, just for the alia do you want to say anything alia hashmi are you there alia yes uh, but i don't think uh, huh. what i have to say is going to uh, be linked directly uh, to this conversation i was just going to make a point about um, something that robin said that you know uh, they have not been very successful i mean usaid as an instrument of aid has not been very successful in bringing social change um i have been associated with a usaid uh, project which was actually uh, implemented by a leading uh, ngo for women's uh, empowerment orat foundation it's a very established civil society organization and uh, the point that i was going to make regarding why sometimes you know it's hard to refuse an aid offer is because there are certain sectors for which there is just not enough budgetary allocation in our national and provincial budgets to make any um, perceptible difference in terms of bringing about a social change and this was a project which brought together the women development departments of all the provinces on one table and it sort of facilitated them to carry out certain interventions which they would never have been able to carry out because of their very limited meager budget so i think in a discussion like this we have to really see many sides of the picture and i'm afraid that you know the discussion that is going on today is very very one sided and it almost feels that you know uh, there is no like hope for any future engagement because of our past bitter experiences so i think the conversation should be more well rounded thank you we are trying we are trying we are trying don't worry we'll get there okay can we have uh, naeem zafar uh, she uh, she said about this ji naim zafar sahab no he's not there okay can we have ajwad sahab uh ji i'm here um uh, thank you my question is for robin robin if you look at how the us foreign aid has evolved over the years in terms of gross national income it's it spends the least amount on development assistance compared to the rich uh other rich countries like scandinavian and germany we're talking about 0.18% versus 0.7% um my question is more geared towards how 
you think the future is going to look. So as we look at the global world order post COVID, it's clear that it would be bifurcated into two parts. One that aligns with China and the other that aligns with, with the US. And it's very clear that Pakistan's uh, friendship or loyalty are more closely aligned with that of China. So do you see the foreign aid that Pakistan has been getting over the years to go even down further? How do you see this evolving over the next few years? Thank you. Shahid Wahid Sab. Shahid My name is Mohammed Shahid Wahid and I'm a research scholar at Life Economic Research Center. Sir, my question is that if we see the data literature of aid, India and China gets more um, in a time, uh, are the highest recipient for aid. And they use aid efficiently. And that's why they get better results from them. My okay. question is something like that. That what are the main key indicators that Pakistan can't use it efficiently? What are the main key indicators? And what should be the alternatives for aid if it is scarce in case of Pakistan? Fair is enough. there any alternative for aid? Thank you, sir. Fair enough. Okay, Maliha? Maliha Bangash? Ali, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening to both the speakers, everyone, and the things up. And thank you very much for a really interesting and very, very, uh, uh, you know, informative session. And thanks for the candid insights. I have two uh, short questions. Uh, one, uh, the first is for Mr. Hussain Nadim, who gave us very uh, great insights on the complexity of the matter of aid. And my quick question to you would be that um, what, uh, in your opinion and in your erudite, uh, you know, um, um, understanding of, of this matter, this complex matter, um, is the way forward for, for Pakistan? And how, if we had to, at a policy level, think of something we could do differently, what would those be? And uh, to Miss Robin, um, again, thanks for the very candid uh, and very honest and sincere assessments. Um, I have been working uh, on a little bit, uh, I have been involved on the aid side as well. I've been working with donors, but I hail from the private sector. So in the private sector, um, uh, mostly I have done investment work and portfolio um, investments. And I saw that in many of our aid programs, there was um, a lack of what we in the private sector talk about when we look at equity uh, investments or we took a look at any portfolio, we look at attribution analysis or an assessment of the impact or the returns, for us it's the returns. Uh, of what we've been doing. And then we look at how we can do it differently if we shuffle uh, the, the funds that we have and how the impact can change. And I'm just wondering that in all these years, has any such mechanism, uh, I'm not now talking specifically to Pakistan, any, any such mechanism been exercised in some other, for instance, areas where aid has been used more efficiently? And has, can something like that be used here such a model because I think it's lacking right now, and it is that is why perhaps uh, results and impact are not clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. Shaheen and Nisar. Uh, this I'll cut off the questions. Shaheen and Nisar, one more. Uh, hello, uh, Assalamualaikum. Um, I have worked uh, and reviewed several uh, several aid recipient countries programs uh, in the countries. And I have come to this conclusion that aid should be taken very seriously as an added item in the budget. As um, um, I think Hashmi has said, that you, know, you need social development change. Aid should be used for, I think, technical assistance and capacity building, but with clear definition of what you need aid for, what your target should be for for technical assistance results or capacity development, because they should be related with the results and then you know, proceeded thereon. I can understand that you know, different donors have different policies and you know, we cannot uh, blame them. Every country is a sovereign country and every country should focus on her own interest. And we cannot blame the USTDA 
for you know, anything. We should be vigilant what we want. It should be need driven, but with good checks and balances. Great, thank you. SM, last question, SM, who's SM? Anybody SM? Yes, sir. This is Shahid Mahmood. Okay. Okay. Just a quick, uh, uh, just a quick note. Uh, you, I used to work in one of the programs uh, that was sponsored by a donor, and it was supposedly capacity building. So let me tell you in the end uh, who were the benefits of that capacity building. Uh, one, uh, Babu, who was about or a bureaucrat who was about to retire in three months, he went to Harvard for a course for capacity building. So uh, I, I am sorry. Uh, whether it's a TARP in FBR, Federal Board of Revenue, or whether it's a capacity building program in any, any other institutions, I have yet to see how donor aid works in favor of Pakistan. I have yet to see that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, I'll come back to the panel, but before I do that, I have to also invite Rhonda. Rhonda person is here. She used to be the administrator for the Canadian aid. Rhonda, do you have any thoughts on the subject? Would you like to? Say something and ask Robin, you know Robin able to ask her. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nadim. I just sort of suddenly came on this webinar and saw all of you. It's a very interesting webinar. Thank you so much. Very, very thoughtful. Very good points. And, you know, foreign aid is a very difficult subject and it's becoming even more political, I think, these days. Um, but uh, the question that was just raised on capacity building, you know, that's a very interesting one because Capacity building is so critical, but it's so skewed in its implementation. I mean, sometimes, you know, donors call a two-day training program capacity building. Um, you know, I think the whole issue of the unrealistic expectations of aid is very important. And uh, the rhetoric does not match the implementation. And uh, I think your webinar has really hit it on the head, but I'd love to participate in the future and continue on uh, with these, we'll uh, Nadine, thank you. We'll look forward to it. Look, there are three things before I'll say, but before I hand it back to uh, Robin and Hussein. One is when you're doing analysis, nobody's blaming anybody. It's not a question of blame. It's a question of understanding what's happening. The reason we are doing these webinars is not for blame, but for understanding aid, because quite frankly, aid is a very under-researched topic in our country. Nassim Zera was here, she should tell us there are no programs that are done on aid at all on our television. There are no research papers in HEC on aid at all. There are no research anywhere on aid. So the reason we are doing it is because we are trying to unpack, open up the box and see what's happening. And it's not about blaming or whatever, but the point is that Pakistanis, we have to ask the question, what is the impact of aid on us? If I, I don't have the time, otherwise I'll ask Fahim, maybe Fahim, if you get it ready, just show them those slides on um, the, the complexity of aid. For example, Fahim showed us yesterday, there are, there are about, I think, 200 agencies in Islamabad. There are about 500 missions in Islamabad every year. Two missions a day that are looking for time from the finance minister. So, I mean, it's not as if aid is a free good. It has very real consequences, so we have to think about it. The second thing, the, the aid has created a jargon that it cannot define. And I think it's up to us again to unpack the jargon. What is technical assistance? What is capacity building? And as many of you know, I was in the IMF and I was part of the capacity building. I was part of the training. I was part of everything. And I used to tell my bosses all the time and I used to tell my colleagues all the time, guys, and I tried to do this and nobody would allow me to do it. I said, can we have a conference on capacity building? Can you please explain to me what capacity building is? Even though I lead capacity building missions, I do capacity building missions. But every time I go on capacity building missions, I tell my friends in the countries, don't listen to me. I'm doing this for my bosses. I'm not doing this for you, right? So I think we have to unpack these terms. What do they mean? Are they helping us or not? So that's just for clarification, not meant for Hussein and Robin, but Hussein and Robin, go ahead and you answer whatever you like. And in, in that, if you can tell us what capacity building and technical assistance is, I'll be very happy. Who do you want to go first? You can, Robin, go ahead. Okay, okay. A uh, mm -hmm. couple of things. First, I totally sympathize with what Nadine just said. Uh, I want to go back to a couple of questions that were asked. Uh, first of all, to uh, the woman who was talking about the Orth Foundation and the need for support that the government uh, doesn't prioritize at this point 
for women's groups uh, to help women find their voice, get interest, get uh, organized, get into uh, whatever, whether it's politics or, or the private sector or whatever. Uh, I, when I said um, we don't know how to do a lot of these capacity building programs and so on and so forth, I would just say that there is room uh, for some of these small grants and uh, women's groups would be on the top of my list for that sort of thing. So that's just one specific point. Um, you know, for the future, we do need a kind of reset. Uh, both the U.S. and Pakistan bilaterally, but the, the donor community writ large. We need to prioritize what we want things to, what we want funds to be spent on. We need to understand what capacity building is, if, if, that's, under, if that's a priority. I think it is, but as I said several times in the course of this webinar, I don't think we really know how to do it. So I think we need to... Uh, to prioritize, be honest with each other. You know, somebody was was suggesting that um, we don't we don't assess our programs, and we don't look for outcomes um, properly. There is a huge industry in evaluating aid programs and trying to figure out what the outcomes are, what the outputs are, whatever, whatever. But I don't think the data has yet come to a point where it's helpful. I'll just say that. But it is a huge industry, and it's not like people haven't thought of it before. Uh, in terms of the future, uh, will you know, it is true that USAID, or the US has a, has a smaller percentage of GDP going to aid, but it also has a large GDP. You know, I just, I don't think it's the amount of money as, as I, the point I made in the beginning that we were overwhelmed with money in the Kerry Luger Berman uh, era. So it's much more about figuring out which programs really work or are likely to work. Um, less money is probably, probably better. Uh, and a real dialogue, a real dialogue between donors um, and and the Pakistan side. And that means a lot of homework has to be done on both sides. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Hussain, uh, let me ask you, I mean, you can answer all of those questions, but along with that, I think there is absolutely no doubt about it. The team is right, and many people are right. The fault lies in us, we don't have any planning, we don't have any thinking. But in a sense, as I look at it from a point of view, we have kind of the, when you're oversupplied, from addict's point of view, when you're oversupplied with something, it's very hard to give up the addiction. So since we are oversupplied with technical assistance and capacity building, they tell us what to do in terms of, you know, doing democracy, tax reform, this, that, etc. Is there an incentive for our ability to think to come down? And I would submit to you, think about it for a minute. When we talk to Gustav Papanek and people in the past, Ralph Brebelty, for example, had a book. In the old days, our bureaucracy used to do a lot of research, and Ralph Brebelty wrote a book, you might have seen it, two volume book on the research in Pakistan. Today, I don't think we can even, I look at the websites, I don't see any research. So has the capacity declined because of the oversupply of aid, or is it just my feeling? Okay, thank you so much. So many things that uh, I think we've jumbled all together and uh, too many things to unpack. But I would uh, seriously take uh, a difference of opinion on this idea uh, that you raised and uh, Nassim Zaira, who uh, is a good friend and also a really good writer. I read a book as well recently on um, cargo was really good. I don't agree to this point that you can reduce the entire problem of US Pakistan relations, aid relations to to a merry idea that, oh, we've not done our proper research, we're not thinking. That is too simplistic, and it takes away the burden of blame mm -hmm. towards the fact that we are somehow incompetent or we are not thinking. I do not agree to that. My entire PhD thesis actually refutes that point, that we are somehow irrational actors who are sleeping and who don't know what's going on. We are not naive, and by we, I don't want to say a particular uh, a nation because I don't know who we are. There are institutional interests that are play over here. The institutions that want to do and want to get what they want, 
they have gotten what they want. And I want to give an example to everyone here in the scene, Sarah, as well, if she's listening here. Uh, she mentioned that what did we get in the Afghan war? The institution that wanted to get what it wanted out of the Afghan war and engaging with the United States got the nuclear enrichment program done right under the nose of the United States. So when we tend to believe that our narrative is somehow not picking up in the United States or we're not getting anything in return, we may need to pause a little and recognize what is that we get, what is that the priority is. So for the civilian government, they probably didn't get anything out of it. But during the military regime, Zia got what he wanted. And that's not just during the Zia's time, but after 9-11, a particular elite establishment, it got what it wanted on both sides of the border, the militarization, the reformation within the military, the entire uh, enrichment of the upgradation of the Pakistan army. So those things have happened. So it's our priorities are not right. It does not mean that certain institutions or certain uh, groups within Pakistan are not thinking. It's just that they're thinking on the wrong side when they can benefit from the U.S.-Pakistan relations tremendously on across the civil and other aspects. They have reduced the Pakistan-U.S. relations to a particular narrow lens of the military. So I, I would like to dis, uh, agree on that specific point that uh, there is no thinking going on. There is thinking going on. Unfortunately, it is not the right thinking. And a few, very few people have made uh, in, have made a lot uh, of money or interest of specific institutions and, institu uh, and other groups as well. Now, moving forward to your specific point on aid and how do we uh, go around it. Uh, you see, you can right now in Pakistan spend $10 billion, $100 billion, $200 billion. The effect and impact will be negligible because you don't have the right environment. As long as you do not have civil services reform, governance reform, you can keep throwing in whatever money that you can. It does not have the absorption capacity. It will not go anywhere. So what you do eventually is that for any specific project, for instance, when I was working in the planning commission, you would have projects coming up from your own institution fight uh, where you are right now on increasing the development funding for fight. Now, when we would ask what exactly is the numbers and why are the numbers needed? So you would need the numbers to hire more staff people, for instance, the PNs. You need a few more cars. You need ACs. You need uh, stationary and all. There was no enhancement of fund, research funds, for instance. So our idea of aid specifically in the government is still very much about nuts and bolts and about getting new uh, equipment and getting new cars or getting new uh, uh, machinery for that matter now that is where the key problem lies in because for us in the government the entire aid foreign aid coming from abroad is essentially as we, we tend to think of it as free money Unfortunately, in the in the foreign policy, in the security policy business, there is no there is no free lunch at all, and that is where the key problem is that our priorities are not right. We are thinking, but we are thinking in the wrong direction. We are not thinking it as a whole of a country. We are thinking as of a whole of an institution, which is somehow separate from the entire of the government and entire of the people. The policies are not pro people. So it's when we think of aid, it's not that how we are thinking and imagining the impact it will have on the common people. In or in Punjab, the impact is how it can actually uh, uh, grease an already existing aid industry that exists. And the aid industry starts from the very top, and the actual amount of dollars that come and go onto the ground is, is I think, one of the studies pointed out uh, 10 cents to a dollar or something around that. So, in that context, I think it, it, it becomes problematic to talk about aid as somehow disconnected from the rest of the problems of governance. Uh, the politics, the post-colonial predatory and oligarchy that we still continue to have. In that part, I tend to believe aid as a new form of neo-colonialism where both, it's not the United States alone, the US is there for its own interest, but a particular elite within Pakistan as well has an interest to continue the status quo. And aid is where these two different parts uh, sit and talk and have a sort of uh, uh, a discussion over how things can be done with Nothing ever changes practically. Mm -hmm. I, mean, that's, I think that's absolutely correct. In a sense, what's happened is that the, despite what Robin says, 
that aid is trying to create a social transformation. Aid is actually preserving the status quo in Pakistan and in, in Africa and many other countries. Aid is in fact preserving the status quo. But let me take it back to Naseem Zera. She wants to comment on what she said. Naseem, go ahead. Naseem Zera. Unmute, please, Naseem. Okay. Ji, can you hear me now? No, we can. Go ahead. Ji. Okay, yeah, and Nadeem, I, um, Nadeem Hussain, basically, um, I guess we're agreeing, there's no disagreement there. My point really was that um, it's not a question of small Pakistan being a small country, nobody listening to Pakistan or, you know, or US, um, uh, the US government getting what it wants to and Pakistan getting what it's, I mean, and Pakistan basically not managing um, economic development, social change, uh, structural reform, etc. Th and I was saying that the way we are positing this question is wrong. US aid has largely, and I mean, I, I use the word linearity. I think we've had a linear um, uh, are in nature of serious engagement. When I say serious engagement is like, you know, w where we got what we wanted from the US, uh, it's been basically a, an institutional interest. I mentioned the word institutional, the individual interest. The question is that our engagement with the US, 50s, 80s, and during Musharraf's time, it got the army what it wanted to get. And I mean, in the 50s, obviously, we propped up our, our security. In the 80s, we, uh, you know, we continued with the nuclear program. But uh, it, the, the policy in Afghanistan wreaked havoc in the country. And that's what I was talking about. And there, of course, there was uh, major issues with the thinking. I don't think um, Nadeem Lak is talking about just research figures. I think the question is, what have, have our priorities been? So the problem is really, as I mean, yes, the aid, the broader aid discussion is a complex discussion globally when you look at aid, etc. But we're talking of Pakistan USAID. I would submit that, I mean, I agree with Alia. I've been, you know, I worked with CEDA for years, with uh, Swiss CEDA, with Canadian CEDA. So I've been on the other side as well. And, you know, funding um, women's projects and NGOs, etc. Uh, and it's utility. I mean, uh, Nadeem ul -Haq, I'm sure, and others will tell you what disaster aid has done for the industry in Pakistan, you know, PKK and NDFC, etc. And, you know, what was promoted, but the problem lay in Pakistan, not in uh, not in the U.S. And I would I would really say the problem is, you know, how we have looked at it linearly. I mean, what has uh, the Afghan war done to us? And also, you know, in civil military relations, let me say this to you: in civil military relations, a close study of that will tell us that ultimately, ultimately, where it came to the interest of the military ruler in power, he was he was not going to listen to what the U.S. wanted. I mean, Jal Musharraf um, uh, moved ahead during his last days and did what he wanted to. So what I'm saying is that we in Pakistan, the problem is uh, is really internal. The problem is 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 the structural problem of you know how the institutions are working, uh, national security, who's determining, who's defining, also how competent um, civilians have been. That's another debate, but. Uh, I think that there's no, uh, I'm completely um, in agreement, Nadeem Hussain, that, um, that it is about uh, one institution, uh, you know, achieving what it's wanted to. But uh, so I was saying, don't look at USAID as, as some kind of aid that is here to ensure uh, structural and uh, socioeconomic reform. No, it's been linear and it's caused disaster in Pakistan. Yeah, it got us the bomb we would have gotten anyway, but it's uh, certainly caused disaster here in terms of our policies. Thank you. Okay, great. Javed Masood, sir, very quick comment. Javed Masood, not here. Yes, Go ahead. Uh, sir, I want to ask uh, that how would uh, we maintain the pay and perks of our elite bureaucrats without economic, I, I should rather call it uh, economic rate, not aid, on Pakistan. If we okay. cannot, then these elite bureaucrats would always support economic, uh, economic aid from uh, foreign countries. Okay, great, great. Okay, you, okay, great. So let me come back to um, Robin. Uh, Robin? 
your last thoughts. Okay. Um, am I, yes, unmuted. Uh, one important point when you're talking about whether Pakistan or the U.S. got what they wanted, uh, it is important to separate uh, military and civilian aid, military aid and, and development assistance. On the, on the military side, I think more or less uh, both sides got what they wanted. Pakistani military got equipment, money, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the U.S. side got support for, you know, the, the projects of the day, mostly in Afghanistan. So uh, that's different from assessing the effects of, on the economic side. Um, I think it's important to remember that. And I would just reiterate um, that there needs to be continued and serious rethinking. And on the Pakistan side, they need to know what they want. Uh, and on the donor side, in the U.S. in particular, we should resist pushing our pet programs on you uh, and try and help in a dialogue, help you crystallize what you need and us develop something that's responsive to that. I, I think that needs to be the way of the future. And if there's less money, which I think there probably will be, uh, that's, um, that in a sense makes that all easier. So thank you. Hussain Nadeem, tell us, is there any room for us to do things better? Or are you telling me, when you say to me that the establishment got their what, what they want? I, I, I think the idea that you, you, your model also suggests that the establishment is totally rational. All they want is a bomb, and even if we go to hell, we have the bomb. That's fine. So is, do, is that irrationality part of your model? OK, so. I, if you look at Pakistan, when I study Pakistan, I don't study it as a fully integrated, mature nation. So the lens I have to, and I believe we need to use, is that of Pakistan as a state that is yet to verify its hegemony on key resources, uh, on national narrative, a state that is still under a, a fluid state uh, going on right now. So when I see it that way, I do understand that particular establishment because of its military interest. Because and I, I, I kind of like can understand as well because you have border disputes on both sides, and within that disputed, secure, highly securitized region, uh, a particular institution takes a prominence in both the budget and otherwise in the society. So, uh, so there are certain portions that I can understand on that part. Yet, should we stop at that? No. I personally think that what has happened in the past has happened under the Cold War context, under the 9-11 context. Now we need a new social contract where we are able to imagine and understand what is that exactly we want. We can continue to blame a particular institution in Pakistan, it won't take us anywhere. Or we can continue to take blame corruption, it won't take us anywhere. How do we develop a new way of thinking about restructuring the country, which is why I believe that civil services and governance reforms is so quintessential for Pakistan right now that moving, unless and until we do not conduct an overhaul of the system, anything that the current prime minister does is essentially temporary and uh, will have a negligible effect. And you can't continue to have small islands of reforms you need to conduct a threaded a wholesome reform that will actually work and then these questions about um, foreign policy about aid policy and why a particular institution has been able to have a dominant interest and be able to absorb it i'll give you one small example for instance at the time of the kerry Luga berman act uh, the aid that was coming to the civilian side and the aid that was coming to the million, uh, the military side. These are two different components, the military and the development assistance. I did a comparative analysis on that to look at the absorption of this aid. In the military side, the absorption capacity was beyond 85%. There was very, very, very effective organizational structure where the military aid would come in, they would be able to absorb, and they would have a very crisp idea in terms of existing. A, B, C, D, E, F, G of what they want from the United States. On the civilian side, the capacity and the absorption was completely off the charts. I mean, in terms of its ability to understand or request or develop projects, it did not exist. 
well, so that's the reason why when uh, in the first year of the Kelly Luga Bamal Act, when 1.5 million dollars was allocated, only 250 or 300 million dollars was actually allocated and was able to be dispersed on ground. So these are some civilian capacity issues, and I do believe that uh, unless and until we don't have the reform, then I'm going to stress a lot on this thing. Uh, rest everything is, I think, just a conversation. Great. Thank you very much, folks. It's been uh, another great webinar. My concluding comments are very simple. I think Hussain uh, Nadim is right. We are not yet a mature nation. We have destroyed our own infrastructure, social infrastructure in particular. And as we said, we uh, did this webinar with Gustav Papanek and what you said, Hussain uh, and Robin. We are still living with the model that Dr. Mahbubul Haq and the Harvard Advisory Group, which I call the Huck Hag model, that model that they gave us in the 1960s, which was they'd get more projects, build more brick and mortar, borrow more foreign dollars, and don't develop any social infrastructure. We are still living with that model, even though the world has changed. My classmate Paul Romer got the Nobel Prize last year for saying that physical infrastructure does not matter, social infrastructure matters, ideas matter. We don't invest in ideas and the biggest problem that we've got with aid, which is where I think we need to take the discussion. I, think, I don't agree that this business of uh, you know, establishment taking over. Ideas matter in this world, and what matters is how you organize your space, which is the message of Asimov, Blue, and Robinson. We have failed to develop our institutions. We have failed to develop ideas in our country. We have given up the space of developing ideas to donor agencies. All the consultants that are listed, they came and did our web up down bundling. They did our civil service reform. They did our tax reform. The consultants do our policy without taking responsibility. And Robin is right. There is an inspector general's office, and I'm sure of saying you've seen the reports. I've seen the reports. The World Bank has an office. We've seen the reports. We've seen the fund office. The fund is just doing an evaluation for us. And guess what? It's very interesting. The fund is doing an evaluation with Russell Kincaid, who's sitting in Washington, who's never been to Pakistan. Well, he's been to Pakistan in missions in the last time. But he hasn't come to Pakistan now. He's just doing a few interviews with people and doing an evaluation. That's what an evaluation is. When you go to the evaluations, almost all the evaluations say the project is unsuccessful. But who cares? What does it matter? Because the rest of the web edge is sort of so much jargon. It's like your data, you can't untangle it. So I think it's up to us to study our own system, our own aid demand, and our own ability to absorb the aid and where we are growing. And for that, we need to change our model. We need to develop our own systematic thinking. We need to do a lot of stuff. It's all right. I know it's become a common industry in Pakistan to blame the army and not look elsewhere. But we have a larger institution failure than just the army. And the army didn't do it. We did it to ourselves too. And there's a huge failure. I agree with Hussein. Civil service reform is necessary. But who's going to talk about it? We will do another civil service reform webinar. We did one. We'll do another one on the 27th of August. And hopefully, we'll take it up. We'll do another aid seminar, too. We'll take up a lot of things. Our hope is to create the idea space for the change. And that, let's see if we succeed. It's a tough job. We can't do it all. Thank you very much, folks. All the best. My, I'm very grateful to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.